Welcome back to our Made of Methodist YouTube channel. And I heard a story that I thought I would share with you. Um, it goes something like this. An exhausted young mother dragged herself to the telephone when it rang and listened with relief to the kindly voice on the other end. How are you, sweetheart? What kind of day are you having? Oh, mother, said the woman. I'm having such a bad day. The baby won't eat. The washing machine broke down. The house is a mess. We're having two couples over for dinner tonight. I haven't done any shopping. And to top it all off, I sprained my ankle and Sean won't help. Sean, the voice said. Who's Sean? Why, Sean, my husband, of course, said the exhausted mother. You mean Jim, don't you, said the voice. Is this Julie? No, the mother replied. This is Tiffany. Oh, said the voice. I must have dialed the wrong number. I'm sorry. There was a long silence. Then the desperate young mother asked, does this mean you're not coming over? When we have storms in our life, we want rescue from our struggles. And this is why we're talking again today about this idea of God bringing us rescue when we need it the most. We continue our consideration of what scripture helps us when things are challenging, when we need God's word to clarify the storms that are happening to us and how we might be able to survive them. Last Sunday, we looked at Acts chapter 27 and 28, and this was the story of Paul. Um, he was a prisoner. He was being sent back to Rome. There was a, a storm that destroyed the vessel. There was a shipwreck, and he was marooned on this unknown island. And on top of it all off, he was bitten by a poisonous snake. So he'd been through some stuff. And despite it all, God had protected him. Paul had been in constant prayer, and God responded to his prayers, not only to get through the storms, but we learned last week to bring help to other people on top of that. And what did it look like? Well, Paul spent three months there on the island of Malta. And because he was preaching the gospel, ultimately the Maltese people were saved. And for all the generations that followed 2,000 years later, it is a Christian place. And our lesson, at least one of them from that particular passage, is that on occasion... We must glance back at the shipwrecks, the problems, the struggles we've had in our life, the tough times where God had to save us, and remember. Now, we're not going to dwell on the past, but we're going to remember how God saved us. And in analyzing that, see what other things may have happened, how others might have been positively impacted by our amazing rescue. In hindsight, how do we remember what occurred to us and how it may have impacted other people in a positive way. This is how God works, after all. It's not just the amazing rescue, it's the aftermath of that rescue and how God might begin to work in the lives of other people beyond us. And today I want to talk about what happened to Paul after he left Malta. What, what's the story from there? Well, we got to go back to the book of Acts, the church history book. It sits alone on its own shelf. Remember, the Bible is like a big bookcase. And so we'll take a look at the Acts of the Apostles, the church history book. It's written by uh, Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And this is what he notes in Acts 28, the final chapter, beginning of verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. Verse 13, from there we sailed and arrived at Reguam. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Putioli, Putioli, which is Italy. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. And when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And so Luke is writing here, after all the drama and after all the danger and fears of Paul's voice, they finally made it to Rome. But Paul is still a prisoner, and he's charged with some sort of crime. It's going to be heard by the emperor. Uh, but he's at least now being treated with some respect. And my guess is that's because the guards who have been watching him 
have seen all of God's miracles, the healings on Malta, and of course have listened to, with the Maltese people, the preaching of Jesus Christ and the salvation that God has provided us. And so not surprisingly, Paul gets a few liberties as a prisoner now, and the guards are a little bit more laxed uh, compared to what it might have been in prison. And we learn, and we will talk about now, the idea that Paul was there under house arrest but he's able to entertain guests. He's able to have people come and see him. And this is uh, not so surprising. I mean, after all, God's involved in the rescue here and sets Paul up in Rome, but it's not normal either. And we shouldn't just gloss over it. I mean, let's be candid. When people are hostile towards us, when we're held in captivity, when our feelings are hurt, especially when family uh, or friends uh, disrespect us or treat us poorly, we normally don't get any courtesies from them later on, yet Paul is getting some courtesies here uh, from the guards who are assigned to him. We said last week, when God rescues, there's often restoration that takes place. So the relationship between Paul and the guard has changed now that they've been through this mutual experience. And the same is true for us. Sometimes when we weather the storm, when we survive those shipwrecks with God's help, like Paul on Malta, God will add extra blessings. Something out of our trouble, where we were rescued, becomes a blessing to somebody else in some way, shape, or form. Even in our relationship with people who have hurt us, they may receive blessings by the, by the observation of God's love and care for us. They may be blessed by that, and it could end up changing their life in a significant way. Now, that may not translate into an apology for their mistreatment of us, but it's not about us. It's about God. It's about ultimately what God does uh, with his opportunities. So the point is that we survive storms and are strengthened, and sometimes our struggle is used to strengthen and improve other people who are in our circle. I heard a study done in North America comparing the differences on how cattle and buffalo handle a storm. And it seems that when a storm comes on the horizon, cattle run. They see the storm coming and they run in the opposite direction. And in the process, many of them get lost uh, and perish because they're separated from the security of the herd. Buffalo, on the other hand, do something quite different. When the storm is coming on the horizon, they seem to instinctively face the storm. They know that that is their strength and that's where their hope is going to be found. And so when the crisis or storm comes upon them, they take it on straight away, head on. Buffalo turn resolutely and face the storm as it comes into their lives. They, they put their heads down and they walk through it. They have this confidence in their strength and the hope that they're going to come out on the other side. And the study notes that fewer buffalo are lost in these types of storms than it is with cattle who run off when every, there's a crisis in their lives. Our approach should be more like the buffalo. We need to, especially as Christians, face storms with strength and hope because we know God is with us. It doesn't mean that all our problems are going to go away or be solved because storms do cause damage after all, but we can trust in the strength and the hope of God that's provided to us in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what's truly amazing. On top of the rescue we're going to receive, the strength and protection we're going to receive during our various storms of life, other people in our circle, in our herd, are going to be positively impacted by what we experience as well. This is the double blessing. Just like the folks on Malta were saved because Paul was saved and placed there. And we have to notice these things. We have to look back on these things. So let's go back to Paul. He is uh, under house arrest. And I said he is initially allowed to stay in a rental home with a guard, 
Um, and I say God blesses him initially with lighter confinement because there will be a time when another storm will come into Paul's life and this arrangement will come to an end. But for now, Paul can have guests visit him and he wastes no time taking advantage of that privilege. Take a look at Acts 28, beginning in verse 17. Three days later, they came together. He called together the leaders of the Jews. When they were assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I had was not guilty of any crime deserving death, but when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I have any charges to bring against my people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It's because of the hope of Israel that I am bound by this chain. So let's consider a recap for a moment. Paul almost dies at sea because of the storm. He gets marooned on an unknown island. He gets bitten by a poisonous snake. When he finally leaves there, he's still a prisoner. He's under house arrest. What's the first thing he does? He goes and confronts those people who have been giving him a hard time, the Jews, the fellow Jews that he has been in opposition with. Now, that's some real buffalo move right there to face the storm head on. For most of us, we would say, I, I, I just want, I've been through a lot. I just want to lay low um, and, uh, and just relax for a while. But Paul instead refocuses himself. He remembers what happened to him on the ship. He was praying for a rescue from God during the storm, and an angel appeared and said, God's going to take care of that, Paul, because you are going to stand trial in Rome before Caesar. Translation, there's still stuff for you to do, Paul. This is not a, a one-off situation. There are things that God wants you to do. Therefore, you're going to be put in the position to do those very things. In other words, there's no time for you to rest. You are to be my witness. Tell folks of God's plan of salvation, the ultimate rescue, after all, from our sins. So what about us? When we are in a tough situation one where we've asked for God's help and we've received some sort of rescue, we got through whatever the storm was, what do we do? How do we handle that situation? Well, Paul's behavior gives us a hint here. We are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ as to how we were able to survive our shipwreck because of God's help. Tell folks of this rescue how we stayed in the buffalo herd, how we faced it head on with strength and hope because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. I can remember back to about 2012 or 14 maybe. My dad had a cancer scare and had to go through uh, colon, can uh, colon cancer surgery. And he was, in telling, he was telling me afterwards how incredible it was that the doctors took care of everything, that he was no longer um, in fear from that uh, illness. And my dad, who was a believer, said to me, it's a miracle. And I responded, maybe as a pastor, primarily as his son and fellow believer, I said, Dad, you got to tell other people about this miracle. You have to share with them what God has done in your life so they can see God's love, they can see God's rescue. You got to be a witness. And he was like, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, one option is you can come to my church and you can share your story. He did. And it was pretty amazing, really. Um, and that sermon got recorded. And every once in a while, I will take it out and I will listen to it and be encouraged. Eight years after that sermon, give or take, um, he died. But that testimony is left for me and for others as a witness of God's rescue, God's restoration, and, and God's hope. How can you be a witness to others for what God has done in your life? How can you be a witness like Paul?
Now, maybe you're not under house arrest and maybe you haven't been shipwrecked or bitten by a poisonous snake, but how can you tell other folks and say, this is what God has done for me and can do for you? This is how much God loves us. Paul is still a prisoner after all. Sometimes we respond to this challenge of being a witness by saying, eh, I still got a lot of problems in my life. Uh, when I get all those solved, then I'll be happy to share what God has done for me during this last storm. And this is not the approach to take because it doesn't ever really solve anything. And as I said, Paul was a prisoner. He still had problems, yet he's being a witness for Christ not only to the most recent shipwreck, but all the way back to when he was uh, converted on his road to Damascus. He's telling people what has happened to him and the power of having a relationship with God. And if you remember, this sort of makes sense because uh, when he's talking to these people, he declares, for this reason I, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. So he's not there talking to them, but for the struggles that he's been having as he goes out and preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. Even though he still has storms, even though he's still struggling, he wants to give people hope of Jesus. As believers, pastors or otherwise, people need hope, and it's up to us to be God's witnesses. By the way, that's the very reason in most churches that we have a moment, some time in the uh, worship service for praises and concerns. Yes, we lift up, lift up our concerns and we ask for prayer. But the praises part of that is meant to make sure that we are sharing with other, others the witness of God's actions in our lives or the lives of those we care about the healings, the rescues, the uh, reconciliations, um, or maybe it's just God was with us during a difficult storm in our life. We all need to be witnesses. We should be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Now, some might say, well, I don't have anything important to say. I mean, what's happening to me is not impossible, you know, not, um, not important compared to somebody else's situation. I mean, no one would listen to me. I, I can't be successful as a witness for Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Paul. Was he successful as a witness? After all, God has provided this light confinement for him so he can talk to other people. Did he succeed when he began to share his faith? Take a look at Acts 28, beginning in verse 24. Some were convinced by what he said, but others did not believe. They disagreed amongst themselves and began to leave Paul after his final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will be, every, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but not perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. Their heart, they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Therefore, I want, to know, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. So Paul is saying, to those of you who don't believe what I'm telling you, understand this was predicted by God. The prophets spoke about this very thing. And so this passage indicates that Paul was successful with some people, but not all. And that's a lesson for us. It's going to be the case that some people are going to listen to us and some people aren't. Sometimes the people who don't listen to us are the ones that are closest to us, our family and friends. So the success of you witnessing isn't on you. That's a God thing. We can't save. He does. We can't rescue everyone, but he can. And so we need to see it that way. We are simply seed planters. We may not be around for the harvest, but we must still plant. We must still talk about our faith and share it with others. Back in the 70s and early 80s, my grandmother talked to me constantly about Jesus. 
And when she died in 1985, I was not saved. I did not have an active relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew who Jesus was, but that's not the same thing as having an active um, confession that he is my savior. But there was a seed planted there that she had cultivated. She never saw me as a Christian, let alone as a pastor, but she dared to witness. And because of that, I was blessed. And I wasn't the only one that she talked to about that or shared in that effort. I'm sure others came to know Jesus because of her as well. I just don't know where those seeds are today. This is what we are called to do. Jesus said, you are to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Actually, it was his last command, according to how Luke records it in his gospel and then also in the book of Acts. Let us find a way to share with other people how God has helped us through the difficult challenges and storms that we face in this life. What can you do beyond your shipwreck? I just want to finish briefly with this witnessing example of Paul as the prisoner at the end of the book of Acts. This is what we learned. Acts 28, beginning of verse 30. For two years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be encouraged by this passage. We need to boldly and without hindrance tell others of God's rescues in our lives. Share his love. Show other people hope so that all God's people can be saved. Amen? There'll be a video attached to the sermon right down there. I hope you enjoy it. Till the next time we gather, be blessed.